Okay, good afternoon, British and American culture class. Um, today, <clears throat> you will have uh, just finished uh, quiz number three, and uh, this is the final uh, online lecture before we do the midterm. It's next Wednesday, so there will be no lecture next Wednesday. Instead, you will have to write your midterm, right, from 12 o'clock until 12.45. Uh, that's October 26th, okay? Uh, today's topic will continue our march through the 17th century. On Friday, we will wrap up um, by talking about the Glorious Revolution, um, war with France, <clears throat> uh, William III and uh, the um, um, Queen Anne, the, the final um, monarch in the Stuart line of kings and queens, Queen Anne, will be on the throne in 1707 when uh, the vote for creating Great Britain, the Union of Great Britain, the Union of Scotland and England passes in 1707. And that's the point where we're going to stop and um, do the midterm. And then we'll switch over, go across the pond, as they say, and talk about America. Um, we'll come back to British culture now and again, <clears throat> especially to talk about uh, imperialism uh, and Victoria, Queen Victoria's reign, long reign in the 19th century. But for the most part, uh, the second half of the course, we'll be talking about the uh, first the American colonies and the revolution and then the development of the United States uh, through the Civil War up until uh, now. We'll see how far we get. <clears throat> anyway, Today's topic is a difficult one. It's the English Civil War. Uh, the reason it's difficult is because it's, it's a very complicated event. Civil wars are uh, tragic things where uh, countries fight themselves. As I said, in this war, there's going to be sometimes uh, fathers and sons and um, cousins and brothers and sisters on opposite sides um, for various reasons. Uh, the first reason is King Charles himself. Um, as you know, right now, there is uh, King Charles III is the new king, and uh, not a very lucky name because uh, things go very badly for Charles I, and they go badly for Charles II eventually, although he um, doesn't die uh, in the same way as his father. But Charles III, let's hope that his reign... Uh, goes better than the first two <clears throat> because they're going, they're going to be the main subjects of tragedy uh, in this story. As I explained, King James actually was the king of Scotland first. Uh, he, he reigned for almost 20 years in Scotland before he uh, ascended the throne at the death of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, as I said, he is related to Elizabeth through um, his grandmother, who was Elizabeth's uh, aunt, right? So there, she, she's, um, he's, he's a nephew. He's a nephew. Um, one, I, probably the most successful thing that the Tudors ever did really was um, a peaceful transition from um, the Tudors, Queen Elizabeth's family, to the Stuarts. So James coming down from Scotland and accepting the throne was a sort of accomplishment, that a big accomplishment, because as you know, when we talked about the Middle Ages, uh, before Henry VII became king, uh, he had to do it by fighting against uh, Richard III in the War of the Roses, and he had to uh, destroy the, the um, he had to win a battle, um, Bosworth Field. Uh, there's a great play by Shakespeare, of course, uh, about Richard III and how um, he uh, dies fighting on the field of battle. And most of the kings in the 15th century died uh, in, in, in war or being executed or, or dying somehow like that. So um, to go from, even though we had Bloody Mary and Edward died early and Henry VIII was a tyrant, we've gone through um, generations of kings and queens here in England with basically the next king or queen being declared without winning wars or fighting each other. This is all going to change um, with Charles. So what's, 
what's the problem? As I said, just like the other kings that became really unpopular, like Edward II or John, King John, Richard the Lionheart's younger brother, who had to sign the Magna Carta. Um, who else can I think of? Richard II, John, Edward II. Those are the particular ones that stand out. They needed money, so they taxed uh, the people um, very heavily, and they fought wars, which for the most part they lost. So you've got, like I said, uh, the death, death, it's always death and taxes. It's um, people dying and uh, people, you know, um, damaging the economy by taking too much money from uh, the, the peasants and the lower class, uh, especially. And um, when that happens and you're losing a war, you become a super unpopular king. It would be one thing if you were, you know, winning a war in France or Scotland or somewhere else. But when you lose that war, you suddenly become um, enemy number one to the people in the kingdom. Basically, the when we look back on this, this event, it seems like uh, inevitable that there was going to be this uh, explosion of violence over the policies of Charles I. But that's because hindsight is twenty twenty, as one of my favorite histo history professors, uh, Robert Buckles, says. You can't look at um, you can't look at the English people and say that they wanted to become us. They wanted to, they're evolving and that they have some sort of vision. The same problem with Magna Carta. They didn't do Magna Carta in anticipation of eventually having a constitutional monarchy and democracy. Um, the Magna Carta in its own day was something that the rich people did to force the king to try and force the king to behave himself, which King John, John signed and then immediately reneged on as soon as he could. And he actually got, as I said, he got the Pope to cancel it. But every king that needed cooperation from the upper class and from the kingdom, from the Magna Carta forward, reissued the Magna Carta until it became an important document. Uh, again, in King, Charles, in King Charles' day, <clears throat> the Magna Carta is going to start to be looked at as a turning point, uh, even though it wasn't. Uh, but they look at it that way, and they also looked at the... Um, Going back to 1066 in William the Conqueror, the English historians, they, it's not true, this story is not true, but they looked at the Anglo-Saxon kings as, as ruling um, sort of with a council, right? So that there was, a, there was an Anglo-Saxon um, council called the Witten, and, uh, but they didn't, they didn't choose the king and they didn't boss around the king. That's not true. Um, they thought they thought that's the way it was, and William the Conqueror came in and introduced feudalism and forced everybody, you know, into uh, slavery and servitude. They call this the Norman yoke. A yoke is like a big piece of wood that you carry on your shoulders, uh, or you use it um, for horses and um, oxes to pull. Actually, horses can't use a yoke very well, so they have something called a horse collar. But an ox uses a yoke. It's a very strong animal, and it can carry a very heavy burden. But a yoke on a human being, uh, if you're yoked to something, it means that you're a slave, that you have to do with the uh, person who is, uh, you're being forced to do labor. And as we said before, uh, 1381 was a very important date because the Peasants' Revolt was an attempt to throw off that yoke. Now, um, that's just a way of looking at history, which is not very accurate. Um, yes, William the Conqueror took over all of England, and yes, he, he harried the North and burned fields and killed people indiscriminately when they tried to rebel. This is true. But um, the kings after that, they actually summoned Parliament. Parliament actually means, in French, parler. Parler, parlement. Um, parliament means to talk and the kings created parliament and summoned parliament when they needed them only in uh, after Henry VIII uh, did, did this parliament start to believe that they were the ones that were sovereign like I said they were the ones that had the power and that they should be deciding things not being summoned by the king but they should be automatically summoned 
So all of these ideas are going to start to surface in uh, the, the Puritan Revolution, you might call it, uh, temporary revolution, but the English Civil War. All these things are going to surface when they perceive that the king is not doing his job properly. Still, many people supported the king, even though he wasn't a very good uh, leader. King James actually was uh, very effective as King's, King James VI. Uh, before he went to England and st started to forget about Scotland, he ruled, he ruled Scotland very effectively. He was a very good king, probably the best uh, king in Scotland for a hundred years at least. Um, so he was very popular and, and he was very good, like I said. He wasn't a warlike king. Uh, he spent too much money, but mostly on his court. And it's not his fault that he has a big court. Uh, he has a wife and he has children and they all need accommodation and they all need... Queen Elizabeth was um, only had to spend money on herself. Uh, she never had a, a real consort. She sort of had some boyfriends and some dalliances. Uh, but basically, she was super frugal, and she even increased the debt. But James, James, uh, throughout his 20 years of rule in England, uh, overspent his budget almost every time. It wasn't really his fault, though, because he inherited the problems of Queen Elizabeth. One, uh, the government was already in debt because of the war with the Spanish, so he stopped that. But two, um, the economy was in bad shape. There's... Uh, just like we're dealing with now. Um, inflation is out of control. The prices um, are going up like 8% from uh, month over month. Um, this is really bad for the economy because you can't afford um, to buy a car. You, you can't afford to spend money uh, if inflation gets out of control. They had the same problem, actually. At the beginning of the 17th century, at the end of Queen Elizabeth's rule, things were getting more expensive. It was about 4% a year, which to us, that's not bad. But to the, the British, um, to the English and the Scottish, that kind of price increase was huge. Because in the Middle Ages, basically, there was zero inflation. Prices stayed the same for sometimes hundreds of years, or they would go up very, very slowly. So 4% a year was something that um, poor people couldn't handle. So. During James's rule, there's a lot of people who are unemployed. There's a lot of people, like I said, this is partly because um, Henry VIII um, dissolved the monasteries and th there's no Catholic church and there's no welfare system or anything to take care of these people. So what the government sees and what King James sees is a lot of homeless, unemployed people wandering around. They call them vagrants. Um, basically, they're migrants. They don't have a, a house and... In some cases, they're seasonal workers. So they, they work on a farm, uh, somebody's land, uh, in the spring especially. And then they might have some time off in the summer, which is okay, I guess. In fall, they would be busy again. But over the winter, um, they would have no job. And they would have nowhere to stay. So they would just kind of travel around. And a lot of them, of course, ended up in the city. Because there was this, this idea that in the city, there was more jobs and more money. And uh, so you had all these crowds of people kind of um, moving around and the economy, this is another reason why the economy is bad is because the most important commodity in England was wool and um, the wool, demand for wool, for spun wool, for clothing was starting to, uh, the market was full. There wasn't a big demand for wool as, as there was in the Middle Ages. Basically the Middle Ages was, you might call it the, the golden age of labor. Like I said, the Black Death came along and uh, killed, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50% of the people. So everybody had a job. Like un unemployment was very, very low and your wages increased because there was less people to do the work. So you could demand more money. This is, again, this is um, connected to the Peasants' Revolt. That's That age is gone. Um, the wool market uh, is sort of saturated, so um, they can't make as much money from exporting wool to Belgium, France, Germany, um, Denmark, uh, and Spain. They, their economy is suffering because their main source of income is wool, and people don't want wool. 
clothing as much as they used to. It's not, and there's too much of it. And they actually, their solution is to make more of it, which makes it worse, right? Because it drives the price down. Um, so you shouldn't, they don't understand economics though. So there's an economic problem, there's a religious problem, and Henry, uh, James does a pretty good job of balancing, uh, doing a balancing act, just like his aunt, um, Queen Elizabeth did, of balancing all these problems. But everything will fall apart for Charles. It has a lot to do, like I said, the X factor there is personality. And Charles believed, just like James, that he was chosen by God and that everybody should just follow what he declared, no matter what. Um, when James died and he became the king, um, he was supposed to be given a certain amount of money called tonnage and poundage for life, which would allow him to uh, pay his expenses for his house and for um, his family and for uh, diplomatic reasons and everything else. Uh, he actually was a great uh, collector of art and uh, loved, you know, uh, continental cart culture and art and music uh, and poetry and literature. So he was a great uh, patron of the arts, but that's expensive. It's expensive to be that person. And um, the parliament refused to give him this um, sort of annual income, which they gave to James and gave to Elizabeth and gave, gave to Mary and Edward. And going back um, to the kings and queens of the previous centuries, they always gave the, this amount of money for his entire life when he became king. But they took this opportunity, Parliament took this op opportunity to push Charles and say, uh, we'll just give it to you for one year. And they're asking him to give Parliament more roles and, and to give Parliament more power, which he's not interested in doing. So he summons Parliament and they uh, haggle and argue over certain things. Um, and Charles gets fed up when they won't give him the money that he wants, and then he sends them home. So he has to find some other way of finding money, just like so this is an ongoing theme since Henry VIII, right? Henry VIII, uh, Henry VII was really good at managing money, but from Henry VIII, there's been chronic problems with finance, even partly because Henry VIII wasted uh, all the money he, he took control of. And um, since, since the, he wasted the money from the monasteries on war and personal ambition, um, they've, they've had to at least call the parliament. And Queen Elizabeth was a master of persuasion. Um, so when she called the parliament, they asked for things and she said, okay, I promise I'll take a look at it, but we really need this money to fight the Spanish. And then the parliament would say, okay. And then they would go home and everybody would kind of like push the problem down the road. Uh, James did the same thing, kept, kept delaying, dealing with the financial problems. So by the time Charles uh, becomes king, it's a it's sort of at a critical point. Um, and Parliament doesn't want to give any money to Charles without some sort of increase in their power. Uh, but he doesn't want to give it to them because he wants to be absolute. Like his uh, neighbor, Louis XIV, um, who is going to become the Sun King, and he's going to tax the French very heavily um, throughout his reign in order to fund his wars. And they're going to accept that um, because, well, there's lots of reasons. French culture is different. Um, and also the, per the personality, Louis XIV was an incredibly hardworking um, individual. Charles is not. Um, James wasn't really super hardworking either, but you know, you can't really expect um, everything to just come to you without putting in this kind of effort. Louis XIV was constantly working, always, always um, trying to manage everything himself. Um, Charles would prefer to have somebody else in the parliament usually do these things for him. He'd appoint people to do certain things. So this is the part personality of Charles. He wants to be divine. Uh, he, he wants to be um, absolute. He doesn't want to work with parliament, but he still wants to get money. So he starts trying to get around taxation, get around taxes, mostly by doing things, manipulative things, like charging people for offices. Like if you want to be a knight, um, he's gonna collect some money, a big fee from you. 
Um, so he was making knights, making people knights, even though they didn't want to be, um, so that he could collect the money from them. Uh, there was something called ship money, which was in an emergency, like when the Spanish Armada was coming. Um, any uh, cities in England on the coastline would have to uh, provide money to build ships. So obviously this was emergency money that was supposed to only happen when the, the kingdom was in danger. But he started collecting ship money every year, um, which is basically tax, right? If you say you got to pay 10% of your income every year um, for ship money, then basically you're, it's income tax. It's not ship money. It's not a, a temporary thing or an emergency source of income. That's a regular um, occurrence. And that's basically parliament says that's illegal. You can't uh, demand money from from the citizens unless you pass the pass the law and the tax through parliament which he doesn't do so they determine that these are the things these are the points that that uh, flare up the the conflict between him and the leaders of the kingdom um, who are against him there's lots of people who are royalists who support him still but there's the people that want more power for parliament and they're called parliamentarians i'll tell you why in a minute but let's also add this religious aspect to the whole situation like i said charles is anglican but he's got a catholic wife who's allowed to be catholic even though nobody else is um, she's allowed to have a chapel and she's um going to do you know her, her own private catholic ceremonies people are when he starts behaving more like a Catholic than a Protestant. As we said, Anglicans kind of look Catholic, but they're supposed to think Protestant. But if he, he seems like he's leaning towards being Catholic, they're talking about another situation like Bl Bloody Mary, right? Like trying to roll back the clock, even though there's not very many Catholics left. And as I said, um, Elizabeth is Protestant. Don't get me wrong. She says she loves the Bible and she, she loves Protestant church and she's not Catholic. But as I said, the Catholic Church sort of naturally fits with a worldview where the king is at the top and has absolute power um, without being checked by councils or parliament. Uh, that's the same same thing with the Pope. Uh, the Pope is supposed to be um, chosen by God, and although he is kind of elected uh, by a council of cardinals, once he becomes the Pope, he's like the prince of Europe and uh, people have to follow what he says. <clears throat> the other thing is Scotland. Scotland is the second kingdom that he rules. Charles is the king of uh, Scotland, Ireland, and England. Um, this is the, th the three kingdoms, right? The three kingdoms. So the problems in Scotland um, related to religion are basically Charles' fault. As I said, the Scottish church, the Presbyterian church, is going to become stronger and stronger, and Scottish people are going to follow that Presbyterianism, uh, Changlo Gyohe, right? Um, Charles doesn't like that. In fact, he wants all three kingdoms to be Anglican, right? Um, Ireland's Catholic, and they refuse to change. He's not really um, a big fan of them being Catholic still, but that's in some sense for Charles, that's kind of. Um, being on his side more so than these Puritans and Presbyterians who when he says okay everybody is going to use this book this English book of common prayer and he tries to force the Scottish people to use it they rebel um, this is what's called did I put it up here uh, over here this is what's called the Bishop's War, because James uh, convinced the Presbyterians to keep the bishops, even though they're starting to rule, basically, like I said, by elected councils, not by single leaders. And each um, presbytery and each congregation is going to kind of have more of a democratic system, which Charles dislikes a lot. So he tries to force the Scots to use this book and to follow the Anglican style of worship. And they basically freak out and reject that. Uh, and then he starts to fight a war. When he starts fighting a war against Scotland, 
This causes the problem because he doesn't have enough money to do this. And Parliament doesn't want to give him money uh, to make an army. Because if he does, then he's going to have an army. And then he could force Parliament to do what he says. Uh, so he doesn't get the money that he needs. And the Scots defeat the English in the Bishop's War. Just like they did in the Scottish Wars of Independence. I mentioned Edward II. Edward I took over Wales and marched up to Scotland and defeated the Scots. However, when he died, his son, not being as good a military leader or charismatic like his father, um, lost against the Scots. And uh, eventually he was kind of deposed um, by his son and by other nobles because of the same reasons. He's fighting a war, uh, English people are dying, and he's taxing people, and they're losing, right? So the Scottish Wars of Independence, they're famous. William Wallace, Braveheart is the famous movie from the 1990s where um, Mel Gibson plays William Wallace. Not all historically accurate, but basically um, William Wallace was a hero who fought against the English and died. And then at the, in the Second War of Independence, um, Robert the Bruce, who is actually descended, he's a Scottish Norman, is descended from Normans. Um, he defeats the English and Scotland re remains independent. Um, that's how, the, how it goes. And Edward III turns his attention to France and Scotland and England sort of don't have a big war for a while. But it, it all kind of overflows into the English Parliament and Charles' uh, conflict with them about who's in control when he decides that he's going to try and unify the religion of the three kingdoms. So this fails and he loses, he loses control <clears throat> of the financial situation. He loses control of the political situation. And um, he, disband, he disbands parliament uh, and he tries people who are not paying the ship money. He uh, tries to throw people in jail. He uses all of these old um, laws to try and lock people up or punish them for not following his, his uh, orders. And um, it, it becomes, the mood in London becomes worse and worse to the point where he doesn't feel safe and him and his family leave uh, and they go up to Oxford. Uh, they leave London. So now London, it, the king's not in London anymore, but parliament is still there. So the king really is in a big, has a big problem here. So he raises his flag uh, which means, you know, bring your summoning the soldiers and loyal royalists, the cavaliers, mostly these are wealthy uh, Catholic or Anglican um, nobles. And he's, he raises his flag, just like they would do in the medieval period, raise the flag and then the, the, um, all the militia and soldiers should gather for the king to go to the king's banner. When he does this, parliament starts to make their own army Parliament has more money, they have control of London, and at the beginning they have um, a disadvantage because uh, lots of the nobles have more money and they have better equipment, but in the long run, Parliament has London, they have control of taxation, um, they can build up an army, they have more people, they have more equipment, and we all know uh, in war, usually that's the deciding factor. Which side has more industrial power or economic power is going to outlast, as long as they keep fighting for a long time, which they do. They, they fight for years, and there's actually two parts to the Civil War. They fight for years, um, Parliament's going to win eventually, because they, they they're going to outlast the king, because he doesn't have enough people, he doesn't have enough money, doesn't have the right kind of equipment. So they have these battles. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, there's other, there's other leaders, but I'm just going to talk about Oliver Cromwell because he's the most significant. Um, he ends up in the end being the person who pushes Parliament to execute the king. He's a Puritan. Right? Charles is Anglican. People are different. Um, everybody's Christian, basically, but the people in charge, people in control of the army and the people in control of parliament, especially Oliver Cromwell, are mostly Puritan. That's why we call it the Puritan Revolution. 
as I said, when they take over uh, and they get they capture the king, he escapes. They capture him, capture him again. They realize that Charles is never going to go along with any of their plans to make him a constitutional monarch. So the, the, the decision is made uh, that he needs to die, right? They call him the man of blood because he's the man who's causing all of this war and all these people are dying. Uh, the Civil War is the, the uh, most, uh, has the most casualties, is the most deaths by proportion of any war in English history, even more than World War I. So um, we're talking about, you know, 10% of the people uh, dying. Uh, when Oliver Cromwell goes over to fight the Irish who are rebelling uh, because of culture, because of imperialism, because of uh, religion, when he goes over to Ireland, he massacres thousands of people and and uh, destroys uh, the agriculture, causing maybe 30% of the, the Irish population to starve to death or be killed directly by soldiers. So he's, he's a very controversial figure. There's a statue of him in London. Um, he, was, he was a fanatic. He was a very religious person. So he... he looked at the Irish as less than human. They were Catholic um, devils and dogs. And they didn't, he didn't look at Irish people as, as uh, equal to English. So he actually was a kind of crusader, kind of crazy 17th century crusade, crusader. When he, when he fought against the Scots, uh, he didn't kill them like that because they're Presbyterian. And Presbyterian, as I said, Puritans and Presbyterians get along because they have the same sort of Christian worldview. And so he would, he would fight the Scottish army, but not destroy the villages or people or towns. He would give them a chance uh, to surrender um, and, and uh, destroy their military power uh, and make sure Scotland was under control of England. But he wouldn't destroy the countryside and um, destroy their crops and their, take their land. But he did do that to the Irish, and he thought he was—he thought he was right. He was a fanatic, um, cruel, um, genocidal maniac in that sense. In the in the sense of like managing the government uh, in England, he did some things which um, people look back at as as a you know revolutionary period. For about ten years, there was first a republic, and then English republic which is the only time England has been a republic, it was a few years, it failed. So Oliver Cromwell took control personally, but he was offered the crown. Um, I guess this is one good thing in his favor. Uh, he was an, an amazing military commander. Uh, he was a cavalry commander and he was an excellent military leader, very organized politically, but as I said, sort of, you can't ignore the dark side of his personality, which was um, looking at other people um, and exterminating people as if they're not human beings and don't have rights. Um, it's very hypocritical of him to do anything like that. So we can't look at him without a, we can't look at him and ignore that aspect. But he did refuse the crown, which uh, he believed that the um, government should not be run by a king. So he became Lord Protector, and in some sense he had more power. But when he died, uh, his son, who was not like him, was sort of a peaceful intellectual guy. Um, Richard Cromwell, when he, when Oliver Cromwell died, did not automatically become Lord Protector or King. So basically the military and the politicians rejected him and just told him to go live in the countryside, which he did. And his son retired and lived a long life, uh, not being involved in politics, which is a sort of strange ending to this story. But Oliver Cromwell um, fought in Ireland, fought in England, fought in Scotland. He was a military sort of dictator, but he refused to, just like a, a sort of uh, Marius or Sulla, like the Roman dictators, the first uh, Roman dictators before Julius Caesar, they sort of, uh, he sort of believed that there should be, the government should be run properly and that there was some sort of um, representative nature to it but the republic the republic failed because the 
the government was dysfunctional, so they needed strong leadership, which he provided. When he died, they decided uh, the English who were quite conservative people generally. They decided that actually the whole experiment with Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans was a mistake. Uh, even though the Puritan government, the um, parliamentary, the protectorship and the Commonwealth was actually very well run government, it was very expensive. And they fought wars against the Dutch. Um, they, fought, it, they were continuously fighting um, the whole time it was going on. And again, that money has to come from somewhere. And um, people didn't want to pay taxes for this. They would prefer to have a king with, with a small government just like the old days. And they started to miss um, even Charles. And they started to miss um, James and King James. And uh, even uh, you know Queen Elizabeth looked pretty good at this point too. So they invited Charles the, um, the first son, also named Charles, Charles II. They invited him, even though he had uh, fled the country when his dad was killed, uh, executed, they invited him back. And he came back, and then he became Charles II. Uh, and he wrote, actually, Charles II is also a very interesting person, but we'll talk about him in next class. Um, like his, he was more like King James. He was more like his grandfather than his father. Quite reasonable person, not interested in war, but he did believe in, again, the divine right. That's why he's like his father and his grandfather. He did uh, think that, um, some people should be punished for his father, but basically the large majority of um, Parliament and the Puritans were, that were guilty of, of um, rebelling and killing his father, he forgave them. He, he wrote something called the Declaration of Breda, which basically said that I'm not going to um, take revenge. I'm going to let sleeping dogs lie. <clears throat> uh, so he, in that sense, he's very much like James, like when he gets control he tries to calm everything down and restore order and peace, which makes him popular. Uh, and he also, like his father, collects art and loves poetry, music, banquets, dancing, that kind of thing. So expensive, even though he's not going to war, but um, for the exhausted English people and Scottish people and the Ir Ireland, which is has been destroyed by Cromwell, um, Charles II is a, the restoration is a good thing at first, right? They, they'll get tired of him by the time he gets older, but at first it's just like merry old England. It's just like the good old days, right? I don't know exactly when the good old days were though, as I've explained, it doesn't sound like, you know, with the, all the famine and plague and war and tyrannical leadership and, and all these things, it doesn't sound like there was really like a good time you know, to be uh, an Englishman or Englishwoman <clears throat> in the last 200 years. Better than the War of the Roses, I suppose, but, you know, pick your, pick your year and there's always something, something bad happening in England for the, this whole period. That's why I said there's kind of five things that contribute to this 17th century crisis, which ends up being the English Civil War. No doubt when we talk about this in class on Friday, there's going to be there's going to be some more questions and I'll try and um, explain, you know, more clearly and more carefully uh, the things that I'm talking about today. Uh, Scotland really is the, the turning point of this whole situation is when Charles decides that he's going to push the Scots to use the English Book of Common Prayer which is a very famous book. It's very beautiful English too, but it's not something that the Scottish were interested in. In fact, they believed that uh, Presbyterianism was being held back by the king already. So as when he did that, they um, got rid of all the bishops and uh, in Scotland too, the Highlanders, some of them remained Catholic, but basically in the, the more populous areas of Scotland, um, the Presbyterians are in control. Um, as I said, there's some good consequences to this whole thing that the Presbyterians start learning how to read and the education improves and the average Scottish person is, um, starts to become literate and that there's only a few countries in the world during this time that are the, the percentage of people 
um, who are able to read is similar to Scotland. They're one of the most literate societies in the entire world um, because of this, because of their attachment to Presbyterian, their insistence that we read the Bible and we um, understand it ourselves. So the Bishop's War and the Civil War, all of these things cause such a disruption that they actually want the king back, even though they took a big step and executed him. And Oliver Cromwell led a commonwealth and a republican government for about a decade. They turn around and they decide to invite uh, King Charles to come back. Uh, Prince Charles, King Charles in exile, come back and become Charles II. All right. I, um, like I said, I'm going to kind of rehearse a little bit of this stuff in class to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, but the things that are on the board, are these are the things that you have to um, try to remember. These are the basic main points. But if there is some, something I need to clear up, we'll talk about that on Friday. And uh, we'll, like I said, we will, um, we'll talk a little bit more about Scotland because it's at the end of the chapter on page 127. Uh, it's just a really short thing, but I'll discuss that quickly. And then we'll talk about the Glorious Revolution of 1688, which is another Divine Wind uh, episode, another, um, another episode in the series of Divine Wind, you know, godly interventions on behalf of the English. Um, we'll talk about Protestant English. We'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the Union, and uh, two of the famous, most famous English people at the end of the, the 17th century, um, Sir Isaac Newton, who you all know, I'm sure, and John Locke. Okay, thank you for tuning in and uh, good luck on your quiz. I'll see you on Friday before the midterm. Remember, one week to go before we have the midterm and it's online 12 o'clock until 1245. Have, have a good week.